Hi, I'm David Handel, the CEO and co-founder of I Do Recall. I Do Recall is a spaced repetition flashcard app like no other. It's a technology and a system that helps all students and lifelong learners become more successful and remember what they learn. Learning is a hard business, and I Do Recall makes it easier to achieve maximum success. I Do Recall optimizes the learning process by leveraging proven cognitive science and education science principles. The most important of these is the testing effect and the extraordinary benefits of memory retrieval practice. There is no other studying activity that is more powerful for creating robust recall ability. The next proven principle used by I Do Recall is spacing, meaning spacing over time both of the consumption of your learning content and the spacing of your memory retrieval practices, so-called spaced repetition. Other cognitive science principles that I do recall leverages include interleaving and metacognition training. We've written a lot about these and I will share links in the show notes. Of all the many features that make I do recall special, the most special and powerful is the ability to create and link spaced repetition flashcards to the concepts and facts in your learning materials that you want to remember. We call these one-of-a-kind flashcards recalls. Let's take a quick look at how you create a recall linked to something you've learned in your study materials and demonstrate how that link is useful when you practice memory retrieval. We're here in the library of this demo account and I've uploaded a few sample learning files. We'll open one and pretend that we're reading the content. Now imagine we've just come across some concept that we've grasped. We comprehend it, but we want to make a flashcard so that we can do memory retrieval practice and ensure that we remember the concept. I'll use this tool to create a recall. I'll highlight the text and click to create the recall. Notice how the highlighted text has been copied into the answer field. If we want, we can edit the text into our own words. Now I'll type in a question and then save the recall. Let's see how this recall looks during practice. Here you see the question. Try to retrieve the answer from memory. When you're ready, let's check the answer. Now imagine for a second that we've struggled to recall the answer. With ordinary flashcards, even ordinary spaced repetition flashcards, you have to remember to look up the answer in your notes or wherever you learned it after you finished your practice session. But with I Do Recall, just click the source link and the content where you learned it will open at the exact relevant location. Quickly refresh your memory and then return to your practice session. We're now going to work our way through the various sections and features of I Do Recall. This is a long video, but it's organized by chapters. And although you can watch it straight through, you may want to use it as a reference and jump right to the chapter that you currently need. First, let's take a look at the library where you add your various learning content to the app. The library is the central repository of all your learning materials. You can make this the hub of all of your learning content for the rest of your academic and even post-academic life. You can add many file types to your library, such as PDFs, Word files, and images. More than 20 file formats are accepted. You upload these files directly from your computer or mobile device. During the upload process, you will get to set some metadata for the file, such as its title. You can and should tag the file for its relevant course or subject. I will discuss tagging more fully in a bit, but it's an important habit for organizing all of your files and flashcards. You can also set a custom deadline for the file. If you don't customize the deadline, we'll set a default deadline for you two weeks from today. These deadlines, or due dates, are basically commitments to yourself for when you want to finish reading the file and creating all the recalls that will be linked to the important nuggets of knowledge that it contains. We use these due dates to alert you by email and browser notifications when a deadline is coming up to help you stay on top of your work. When you're finished editing the metadata, click here to complete the upload process. 
Besides the many file formats that you can add to your library, you can also add videos hosted on YouTube, Vimeo, and other platforms. Simply paste the share URL here to add the video. The same goes for audio files hosted on SoundCloud. You can also take notes directly in I Do Recall, format those notes, and edit them anytime you like. You can also create and link recalls to any fact or concept in your notes that you want to remember. Click here if you want to start a new note. You can search your library list by title or tag or a combination of the two. You can sort the search results. You can perform various bulk actions on your library items. To do that, you need to select one or more items in the library and then click the action that you want to perform. The library is the place where you read, watch, or listen to your learning content. We generalize the acts of reading, watching, and listening as the consumption of your content. When you consume your content and you come across anything you've just learned and want to remember, pause for a minute and create a recall. Our unique spaced repetition flashcard that will be linked to that factor concept. When you practice memory retrieval with that recall, if you struggle with the answer, you're always one click away from viewing the source content at the exact relevant location where you learned it. Our document viewer has a lot of different tools on the toolbar. Let me run through a few of them quickly right now. On the far left, this opens a side panel and has things like a uh, navigator via thumbnails. You can also uh, see outlines if the document has an outline or bookmarks. Clicking here opens you into a uh, full screen view and you can also zoom in, pan, and select text to copy and paste or to do other actions. There are also uh, several different sets of tools. We have annotation tools. And you can draw various shapes. You can create a linked recall with one of these three tools. The pin tool drops a simple pin at the region of interest. The marquee tool allows you to surround the area of interest. The highlight tool is very popular because if you highlight some text, it gets copied into the answer field of the recall. Once you've selected your region of interest, click to create the recall. The only required fields of a recall are the question and answer. There is a full featured rich text editor that appears when you click into these fields that allows numerous formatting options. You can also insert images into the question or answer and several other items such as LaTeX formulas. You can even record audio for the question or answer and set the audio to autoplay during practice. Nuclear membrane. Membrane that protects the nucleus. Nuclear membrane. Membrane that protects the nucleus. Let's take a minute to look at a few of the optional features of a recall. The most important optional field is the tags field. Tags are the way to organize your recalls so that you can search for related recalls and perform various bulk actions, such as taking your search results into practice. We highly suggest that you create tags for all of your subjects and courses. You see that this recall already has a tag. If you tag each file in your library, you get a huge advantage and time saver because any linked recall that you create associated with a file will automatically inherit the same tags that already exist on that file or video. Sometimes you'll want to practice certain recalls in reverse where you're shown the answer and you have to recall the question. 
you know, like in the TV show Jeopardy. The most common use case for this is when you're learning a foreign language. Just click Reversible Recall and 30% of the time will randomly show it to you in reverse. Every day, I Do Recall will schedule the recalls that you're closest to forgetting into the Practice tab. But there will often be times when you want to search for a group of recalls and give them an extra practice session, such as the night before an exam. The way you create a tag is simply to type it here. If that tag is already in use, it will be auto-suggested. Click it and it will be added. If you're creating a new tag, hit the Enter key or Tab key to create it. You can add multiple tags. This strategy can be used to refine a search. For instance, you might want to create a tag for one of your courses and create additional tags for each section or chapter in the course. If you create a tag that is a typo and you want to remove it from being auto-suggested, simply click the X. It won't be suggested again unless you recreate it. We'll cover the rest of the optional parts of a recall later. I'll save this recall. Back here in my document, I can click any existing recall and open it for editing. If I want, I can delete it. I'll be given the choice of deleting the pin, which will unlink the recall from the library file, but the recall will be preserved in our collection of recalls. Or I can delete the recall altogether. There is a header above each open file with various useful features. You can see at a glance the number of recalls linked to the file. Here is the name of the file as it appears in your library list. This is the rocket icon you'd click if you want to practice all of the recalls that are linked to this file. Click here and the file will be marked as processed. I'll explain what that means in a minute. Items in your library each have some metadata that you set while adding them to the library. If you want to edit the metadata later, click the three dots kebab menu here and the metadata form will appear. You can then change the name of the file. You can add tags. You will want to cultivate the habit of marking a file as processed, meaning that you're finished consuming the piece of content and you've created all the linked recalls that you'll need. When you've reached that point, mark it as processed. This is analogous to archiving emails that you've read in order to keep your email inbox clean. Let me show you how to watch a video in Ida Recall and create linked recalls. Here is a video hosted on YouTube. I can watch it here, and when I come across some fact or concept that I want to create a linked recall, I just click here to create the recall and fill out the form. My recall will be linked to the current time code in the video. When I practice the recall, if I click the source link, the video will open at the exact time code. As I create additional recalls for this video, they'll each be linked to their appropriate time codes and they'll appear in a list below the video. You can click to edit any of them at any time and then click here to return to the furthest point in your viewing. When you upload files such as PDFs and Word files, you can annotate them, but they aren't fully editable once they've been added to the library in the same way that a text file can be edited in a word processor. One of our most requested features has just launched. You can now create editable notes in I Do Recall. To create a new note, click here. You can type in text, upload images, and, and format to your heart's content. You can click to open the note at any time if you want to add to it or edit it. You can copy from elsewhere, such as a web page, and paste that content into your note. Be aware that even though it may appear that copy-pasted images have been successfully added to your note, they won't actually be saved. If you want to add images to a note that will be saved, then you have to upload the image directly from your device. We have two recall creation tools here in Notes, the Pin tool and the Highlight tool. They work the same way as they do in our Document Viewer and will open a linked note at the exact relevant location when you click the source link during practice. 
Let's close this note and take a look at the library when nothing is opened. You'll see the list of your files. To view an item in the list, simply click to open it. You can close it by clicking the X. These icons tell you whether the item is a file, video, or note. The color of the icon denotes how close it is to its deadline. If it is red, you intended to finish processing it within the next 48 hours, or possibly it's even overdue. The orange-yellow icon means that it's due in the next two to seven days. Gray icons are items that are due more than a week from now. Each item in the list has a title, the name of the file, note, or video. The percentages here indicate how far you've made it through the consumption of the content. This promotes a practice known as progressive reading. You'll recall that it's a good practice to space out your consumption of each piece of content over a period of time. These percentages give you an indication of how much work you have left before you can mark the item as processed and archive it. It bears repeating that it is a good idea to treat your library list as you would treat your email inbox. When you finish consuming a piece of content and have made all the linked recalls, you should mark it as processed. This will archive it and help you keep a tidy list so that you can focus on the unfinished work that you have before you. There are several places where you can mark a file as processed. You can do it on the file's metadata form. You can click the Mark as Processed icon in the header when the file is open. And you can select the file or more, more than one file in the library and then click here to Mark as Processed. Once it's been marked as processed, it'll be removed from your library list of items and archived here with all of your processed items. Click this icon to see a list of the processed items. You can select an item in the list that has been marked as process and then unarchive it by clicking here. It will be returned to the list of unprocessed library items. When you do a search in the library or in the recalls list, if it matches something that's already been archived, it will be returned along with any other matches in the search results. The left side panel lists all of your tags and has a lot of useful features. There's a similar panel in the recall section of the app and we'll save a full explanation for when we review the recall section. Now let's review the practice section of the app. Click the practice tab to practice memory retrieval for those recalls that the I do recall space repetition algorithm has scheduled for today. The number of do recalls are shown in this little orange bubble. For each recall, first read the question and optionally enter your response. You should note that you have the opportunity on the front of the recall to snooze it if you don't want to practice it right now. You can choose one of these options and then click and the recall will be removed from today's schedule and rescheduled based on your choice. Once that you've retrieved the answer from memory or admitted to yourself that you don't recall, click to check your response or hit the return key to see the answer. Then give your performance a star rating ranging from five stars indicating perfect easy recall down to one star if you totally forgot the answer. You can see under each star how many days until the recall will be scheduled and placed again into the practice tab. The scheduling is being performed by the I Do Recall Spaced Repetition Algorithm, which considers the current star rating you're about to issue, the previous star rating, and the time interval since you last practiced the recall. It is important that you grade yourself objectively and with some consistency and impartiality as best as you can achieve. You should try to use the full range of stars and not take a black and white view of your performances. By following these principles, you'll maximize the effectiveness of the uh, spacing algorithm to reap its fullest benefits. Then working the system optimally, the recall schedule for practice every day will be the ones you're closest to forgetting and you'll be minimizing that portion of your collection of recalls that require practice each day. In many places in our UI, you will find helpful information where you click one of the uh, visible question marks. If you don't want to give yourself a star rating for this recall, you can click the skip button. 
Recall will remain in the Practice tab and you'll see it again until you finally rate it. This can be used as a training mode. Sometimes you might want to practice memory retrieval a few times with a new recall before you start grading yourself. If you want to see the rest of the details of a recall, click here. You can also make edits and save them right here during practice. This is helpful because sometimes you may see an error and you want to correct it on the spot or you desire to add some additional information. The recalls scheduled by the space repetition algorithm in the practice tab are the ones that you're closest to forgetting. You can break up your daily practice of do recalls by practicing some of them and then coming back to practice the rest of them later in the day. Click the X or use your escape key to end your current practice session. If you don't complete the practice of recalls that are due today, the ones you skipped will roll over and be added to those that are due tomorrow. Because it's easy to get far behind by putting off your work or going on vacation, we've engineered a system to protect you. By default, we won't show you more than 30 recalls in any given day, and we'll spread the excess over the coming days so that you can catch up gradually. When you exceed the set threshold, you'll see this pop up. When you close at the number of recalls in the practice tab, will be reduced to 30 or whatever limit you've set in your profile settings subpage. You can adjust or turn off this protection in the subpage. I'll show you how to do that later when we review the profile section. When you get to the end of a practice session, you'll see the congratulations page. Here you'll also see a practice more button. Click it and we'll show you some more recalls if you want to get ahead in your work. These will be recalls that will be selected from those due in the coming days. Besides doing your daily scheduled memory retrieval practice, there are many times that you'll want to practice some specific recalls even though they're not currently due according to the space repetition algorithm. Here we are in the recall section of the app where you'll find the list of recalls you've created. Text in the list items here is excerpted from the question section of each recall. This is a handy place for searching, sorting, and performing bulk actions on one or more of your recalls. It's also a handy place to perform editing of existing recalls. You can always click a recall inside its file or video in the library to edit it. A few minutes ago, I showed you how to edit a recall from a, within a document, and I've also shown you how to edit a recall during practice. But perhaps the most common place of to perform an edit of a recall is right here in the recall section. Simply click a recall in the list to open it. Let's spend a little time reviewing the components of a recall in more detail. The Q and A fields are for the question and answer. These fields are required and cannot be empty. They can contain text and we offer a large number of formatting options. Just click into the field to see the rich text editor. It has three submenus. Besides the text formatting options, the editor enables you to insert other items into the question or answer. You can add images, and there are various aspects of image presentation that can be customized. You can add sophisticated typesetting into the question or answer using our LaTeX Composer. This is wonderful for displaying mathematics and physics formulas. Once a formula has been entered, you can easily click to edit it. Other items that you can insert include emoticons, special characters, and programming code snippets. You can record audio for the Q&A field. Your recording will be set to autoplay during practice, but you can uncheck that if you prefer. We spoke earlier about making a recall reversible, but to recap, if you set a recall to be reversible, when you practice it 30% of the time, we will show you the answer first during practice and then you'll have to recall the question, sort of like the TV show Jeopardy. This is especially useful when learning foreign languages where the question is a word in your native tongue and the answer is the word in the foreign language or vice versa. Currently, the 30% reversal rule is hardwired, but we may eventually allow customization. We're waiting to hear back from our users about this. Tags are the way to organize your recalls and the contents of your library 
If you're a student, you should tag each recall and each library file to its related course. To create a tag, simply type it in here. If what you are typing matches an existing tag, it will be auto-suggested. Simply click the suggested tag to add it to the recall. If you see an auto-suggestion that you don't want suggested any longer, simply click its X and it won't be suggested again unless you reuse it in the future. You can ignore auto-suggestions and keep typing to create a new tag. Just hit the tab or return key when you want to enter it. You can add as many tags as you like to a recall. This is a great idea for tagging recalls first for their related course and then adding additional tags for topics, subtopics, or chapters in the course. This is the source link of the recall. If the recall is linked to one of your many library files and you click the link, the file will open at the location of the link. We'll show you other options for this source link field in a little bit. The groups field is where you can share with one or more of your groups, but first we need to explain the groups section of the app in a bit before we can make sense of this field for you. The response log feature is not yet built, but when launched, you'll be able to see all of your past practice performance for the recall. You'll be able to see the date of each prior practice along with any response that you may have entered into the R field and the star rating that you gave yourself. The final feature of a recall is the metacognition training widget. We will discuss metacognition in a separate section in this video and go into how the widget works at that time. This widget appears at several locations in the UI, if I do recall. Besides creating recalls linked to regions of interest in your library content, there are other ways to create recalls. You can create a recall that is unrelated to your library. It has all of the usual features of a recall. The source field will be empty, but if you like, you can type or paste a URL into the source field. For example, you might want to paste the URL of a Wikipedia page into the field. When you practice this recall, if you want to see the source, click the URL and that page will open in another browser tab. Another way to create recalls is to import them. You could, for instance, go to Quizlet and find a set of flashcards on a topic and export that set. Unfortunately, Quizlet only permits the export of the text portion of flashcards. Here's what that process looks like. Search for your subject of interest, then choose the flashcard set that you wish to export. Click the ellipsis and select Export, then copy the text into your clipboard. Next, go to the Recall section of I Do Recall and click Import Flashcards. Click into this field and paste your clipboard contents. You will see the Import Flashcards button become active with the number of flashcards you're about to import. It's a good idea to add one or more tags and perhaps even make them reversible if they're being used for foreign language learning. Then click to import and they will be added to your list of recalls and henceforth will be managed by the spaced repetition algorithm as true recalls. You can import flashcards into your recalls list from other sources including Anki. So long as they are pure text in the form of a plain text file or a CSV, Currently, we don't support the import of media or other non-text items. Now we'll cover the searching and sorting functions in the Recall section and follow by pointing out the differences between searching and sorting in the library. In the Recall section, you can search by tags, by the text that's in the Q and A sections of the Recalls, or by a combination of the two. As you type into the search box, the results list will be filtered. If what you typed matches a string within the tag, it will be auto-suggested. Click if you want to add that tag to the search box. You can add multiple tags to the search. All searches are AND-type logic searches, meaning that if there are multiple items in the search box, such as two tags or two tags and text, a text string, the results list will only contain the recalls which match all of the items in the search box rather than just some of the search items. The number adjacent to the magnifying lens reflects the number of items present in the results list. If the results list fills the screen, you should scroll down the list to continue downloading any remaining matches. 
The count next to the lens will continue to increment as more matches are downloaded. When the search box is empty, the recalls list will reflect all of your recalls, but you need to scroll down to download all of them. The counter will increment as you continue to download. You can sort the results alphabetically, ascending or descending, sort based upon the text in the question. It is the question text which is displayed in each list item. You can sort based upon when the recall is next scheduled for practice by the spaced repetition algorithm. You can sort based upon the timestamp of when each recall was created. This is helpful for quickly locating a recall that you recently created. Lastly, you can sort ascending or descending based upon the average star rating you've given each recall. This is super helpful if you want to locate those recalls that you are performing the worst with and want to take them in for some extra memory retrieval work. Let's look for a minute at the searching and sorting functions over in the library. You can search here alphabetically based upon the name or title of a file, or based upon a tag, or based on a combination of the two. You can sort alphabetically ascending or descending, or sort based upon the deadline, the due date that you set to finish processing the file. Lastly, you can sort your results by their timestamps when they were added to the library. Back in the Recall section, let's look at the Tags panel on the left. This is a part of the UI that is extremely helpful. All of the tags that you've created, whether in the library or here in the Recall section, are listed in this panel. Starting at the top, you can see how many recalls you have in your account. The count next to the magnifying glass in the search box won't reflect this true number unless you have an empty search box and you've scrolled to download all of your recalls into the list. There are a number of helpful tooltips in the UI, and here is another one to explain the Tags panel. Your tags can be sorted alphabetically. They can be sorted by their frequency, meaning how many recalls possess the tag. These numbers here depict the number of recalls that use each tag. If a tag doesn't have a number here, then there are zero recalls currently using it. Perhaps you used it at one time, but deleted it from the recall or library file that you used it with, or maybe deleted that item altogether. Or maybe you have used it in the library, but not on a recall. You can also sort your tags by rating, ascending or descending. Rating is the average star rating you've given for all the practices that you've done on the set of recalls that possess the tag. This is a wonderful tool for finding the sets of recalls based on tag that you've struggled with the most. So click here to sort by rating, and then you can mouse over this region of each tag to see the actual average star rating for that tag. If you would like to take a set of recalls into practice that all possess a certain tag, just click the rocket icon. So to recap, you can sort your tags by rating to find the group of recalls that you're performing most poorly, and then click the rocket icon on that tag in this list and you'll be taken straight into practice for that set of recalls. Even without sorting by rating or any kind of sort, you can click the rocket icon of any tag to take the tag set of recalls into practice. You will remember that you can search the tag simply by starting to type the name of the tag into the search box and then clicking it when it is auto-suggested. Another easy way to do this is to click the tag in the Tags panel. The tag will immediately be thrown into the search box and the list will be filtered to those recalls. If you click another tag in the Tags panel, that will replace the previous one that was thrown into the search box. If you want to add a second tag, or a search string to that search, you'll have to type directly into the search box. If you click Untagged Recalls, you'll see a list of all of your recalls that don't possess a tag. If you want to remove a tag from your account, click this X. Those recalls and library files that use this tag will no longer possess it, and if it's their only tag, then they'll join the list of untagged recalls. Click the pencil icon to edit the text of a tag.
you can add a new tag to your collection here. You can drag a recall and drop it on a tag to tag that recall. You can also do that to a bunch of selected recalls. Dragging and dropping only works if no recall is currently opened for editing. You just saw me select a recall by clicking its icon. Let's talk more about selection. To select recalls one at a time, click their icons. If you want to select all of the downloaded recalls in the list, click the recalls icon to the left of the sorting tool. You can click it again to deselect all of the selected recalls. Another way to select a bunch of contiguous recalls is to click the first one in the series and then shift click the last one. If you wish, you can click any individual recall in the series to deselect it. Before any recalls are selected, the sorting tools are displayed beneath the search box. As soon as you select one or more recalls, the sorting tools are replaced by the bulk actions tools. These tools appear even if only a single recall is selected. The most frequently used bulk action is to practice a group of selected recalls. The typical scenario will be first to search for that group of recalls that share a common tag, and then select all of them and click Practice Selected to take them all into practice. I often refer to this process as manually taking a group of recalls into practice, as opposed to the normal way that we practice by clicking the Practice tab to take a group of recalls into practice that have been scheduled by the spaced repetition algorithm. If you want to delete a selected group of recalls, then click here on the far left. Use this tool to manage the tags of selected recalls. The Tags Management panel will open and you'll see the list of tags that the recalls have in common. There is a list of tags that all of the recalls possess. There is a list of tags that some of the recalls possess. You can click the X on any of these tags to remove them from the selected group. If you want to add one or more tags to the group, then add them here. The actions that you take in this panel won't get executed until you click the Save Edits button at the bottom. You can click here to snooze your selected recalls. Snoozing is an alternative to outright deletion. Snoozing blocks recalls from being placed into the Practice tab until at least the last snooze date you selected. I deliberately said until at least the last snooze date because if one of the selected recalls isn't scheduled to appear in practice until a date after the uh, snooze date that you've selected, it won't appear in practice until its actual scheduled date. Earlier, we showed you how to snooze an individual recall during practice. Here, you can do it to a selected group in a bulk fashion. Perhaps you have a collection of recalls sharing a tag for a course that you just ended, and you don't want to practice them for a while. Just search for them by the course tag, then select them all, and snooze the selection. Choose your snooze date and then click the snooze button. Tomorrow's the chosen default date in the date field until you choose a different date. Share with a group is a feature that we'll discuss in a few seconds when we dive into the group section of the app. Clear deselects the selection group and closes any open bulk action panel. The group section of the app is our social hub. If you're a student or someone who likes to work with others as you learn, consider creating or joining a study group in I Do Recall. If you're an educator, you can create a group as a class and then invite all of your students. The core activity of, of a group is the sharing of recalls and library files amongst the group members. Depending upon the permissions set by the group owner, Members can share recalls and files with the group, and all of the group members can clone that content into their personal I Do Recall accounts. When a member clones a recall into their account, it becomes managed by the space repetition algorithm as they begin to practice it. The member can edit the recall after they clone it without affecting the original one that resides in the group's recalls list. If you clone a recall that has a source link, it will function as expected, displaying the linked file or video at the relevant location, even though that linked file doesn't exist in your own personal I Do Recall library. 
The member who clones a library file into their account can even begin to process it and create their own linked recalls. Files in a group's library are clean and don't have any linked recalls attached to them. Creating a study group or a I do recall class group is a breeze. Click Create New Group, give it a name and an optional description. We give the group its own avatar image, but you can upload your own if you want to customize it. Make sure that you identify yourself with your first and last name so that the other members of the group will know who you are. If you want, you can prevent people who get the share URL of the group from joining and actually entering into the group until you allow them. By default, the members will be allowed to share recalls and library files with the group. But if you want to be the only member with that privilege, perhaps something that a teacher creating a class might prefer, then uncheck this box. When you are ready, click to create your study group or class group. Click to copy the share URL and send it to those you want to join into the group. If someone has received the link but doesn't yet have an I Do Recall account, they'll be taken through the usual sign-up flow for creating a free account and then they'll be shown the description of your group where they can decide if they want to join. Remember that a free account only permits a limited number of recalls and library files, so eventually they may want to subscribe. If you already have an account and you receive a share URL, just enter it here to join the group. Groups have several subpages. Click to open one of your groups. The About page shows some details about the group, including its share link. Any member of the group can invite others by using the share link. That's why you may want to tick the checkbox that will require your approval before folks who use the share URL gain entry. You can leave the group at any time and, if you like, opt to remove any materials that you have shared from being available for future cloning. There is a recalls list unique to every group. Click to open any recall that you might be interested in to examine it and click to clone it if you like. Recalls in the group cannot be edited once donated here. Besides the usual sorting tools, the group's recalls list can also be sorted by the number of times each recall has been cloned. This is a shortcut to find and clone the most popular recalls. You can also sort by the name of the member who donated the recall. Perhaps there's a brilliant member of the group and you love to clone all of their recalls. The recalls list also has bulk actions. You can select a bunch of recalls and bulk clone them. You can delete recalls from the list if you donated those particular recalls or if you're the group owner or a group moderator. We'll cover moderators in more detail in a bit. To share your recalls with a group, select one or more recalls in your personal recalls list, then click Share Selected with Group. Type the name of the desired group and click the auto suggestion. You can share the selected recalls with more than one group at the same time. There is also a share widget in every recall creation and edit form. If you subsequently edit your original recall after you've shared it, those edits won't change the version that you in effect cloned from the group, the one that's in the group's recalls list. And those edits won't affect any copies that other members clone from that group. Also, if you clone a recall that has a source link to a share file in your library, the source link will work as expected for any member who clones it, but the linked file will not appear in the group's library or in the library of the members who clone it. The group's library list works much the same as its recalls list. You can donate files from your computer or mobile device directly to the group, as usual, but the owner or moderator must approve the donation before it appears in the group's library list. We do that so that the library is kept free of duplicate or inappropriate content. To share to a group from within your account, go to your library list and select the item or items, then click Share Selected with Group. Type in the name of the group that you want to share to and click the appropriate auto suggestion. Then click Share Documents. A sharing widget is also present in the metadata form of each library item. 
The member subpage lists all of the members of the group. There are three classes of members. You already know about the owner and the regular invited members of the group, but the owner can also assign moderator status to any other member of the group. An owner of a busy group that's very active may find it helpful to have some moderators help them do some of the uh, routine administration for the group. A teacher may want to have assistant teachers have this status or teacher aides. An owner can click on any member and then give to them or remove from them moderator status. Owners can remove any member of a group and moderators can remove any ordinary members. Owners and moderators can approve or reject content donated to the group. Moderators cannot remove or create other moderators. If an owner quits the group that has members, the members will all be converted into moderators. All groups have a leaderboard where everyone can see various charts and this table depicting the activity of each member. The acronym RP stands for an individual recall practice session of recalls related to the group. From the perspective of a group member, recalls related to a group are recalls that you've either cloned from the group or donated to the group. These last two columns basically tell the story of how many memory retrieval practices you are doing of group-related recalls, and hopefully seeing this data will spur you on to become a leader in your group for doing the most practices that build robust recallability. The group performance subpage is only available to educators with the educator subscription, and it's only shown to them for class type groups that they create an I do recall. Our educator license is available for teachers and is differentiated from our ordinary learner's license because you'll be able to see deep metrics of your students' performance as well as be able to see how successful you've been at getting your class to learn specific portions of the class material. The final subpage in the group is the settings page. Here you'll see data about the group and some self-explanatory settings and features that you can control. You can also resign from the group here and decide whether you want to leave behind your donated materials. Metacognition is a very important topic in education and one that I've written about several times in medium.com. While it has several facets to it, a simple and easy to understand part of metacognition is the act of thinking about your thinking. When you exercise this higher level of thinking, you can take ownership for judging what you know and what you don't know. Armed with that awareness, you can plan and take actions to fill in the gaps in your knowledge. I do recall has a metacognition widget present in several places in the UI that you can use as training wheels to get you in the habit of exercising your metacognition. You'll find this widget in all recall creation and edit forms. It's in the library in the document viewer, and it's present in the practice section of the app. The widget poses metacognitive type questions that you should ask yourself as you learn and deal with new ideas and concepts. You can click here to see a new question to reflect upon. If you want, give a question a thumbs up or thumbs down and you'll see it more or less frequently. While the widget is unobtrusive and easy to ignore, you should avail yourself to use it because metacognition is one of the secret powers of elite learners everywhere. Now let's talk about the header and sidebar of the app. We've been using the header and sidebar throughout this video, but let's take a closer look. The left sidebar, as seen on the desktop version of the app, contains all of the gateways to the major sections of the app. We've used the groups, recalls, library, and practice tabs extensively. I want to reiterate that the practice tab is the only way to go into practice for the recalls that the spaced repetition algorithm has scheduled to be due today. The question mark on the sidebar offers some context-sensitive help depending on the section of the app that you're currently in. There is a link to our online documentation that will open in another browser tab if you click it. If you click Chat with us, a support chat widget will appear on the bottom right. When you're in the library section of the app, 
you'll also see on the left sidebar our built-in Pomodoro timer. The Pomodoro technique is a well-recognized strategy for getting things done using short time periods of focused activity. The timer is set by default to the classic 25 minutes, but you can set it anywhere from 5 to 30 minutes. Use the timer to help you focus on consuming your library content and creating linked recalls. The timer is only present in the library, and if you move to another section of the app or to another tab in your browser while the timer is running, it will pause until you return to work in the library. We track how many Pomodoro minutes you do to show you that data in your metrics. There are some additional navigation options in the hamburger menu at the bottom of the sidebar, including a link to your profile and a link to our online documentation. The header only has a few items. A bonus day is a free extra day of use in your current paid subscription cycle. Our bonus days program is a way to earn rewards by celebrating milestones in your use of I Do Recall and especially by sharing I Do Recall with people in your life. Every time someone in your life you invite signs up and activates a free account with your share link or group invite link, you will earn extra days in your current subscription cycle. Every time one of your invitees makes a payment to us, we'll award you with extra bonus days. Even if you're a free user, you will accumulate bonus days that can be used should you ever become a paid member. You can read more about the plan by clicking here. We really appreciate your support spreading the word about I Do Recall. We'd rather spend our money building and improving the app than spend it on marketing and advertising. We just launched our native desktop app. You can click here to download it to your computer. We're going to talk about it a bit later. At the far right of your header is your avatar and you can customize it. If you click on it, you're taken to your profile. You can also get to your profile from the hamburger menu on the sidebar, but this is faster. We're here in the profile section of the app. There's an inner sidebar for the profile and at the top, you can upload your own avatar or profile photo. If you're joining or creating groups where other people work with you in the app, you may want to help them recognize you by using your real photo. At the bottom of the profile's inner sidebar, you can log out or delete your account. If you delete your account, we'll wipe all your data from our servers. Deletion will occur immediately on our primary servers, but will take 30 days on our backup servers. The profile has a series of subpages. Let's review them in sequence. The account subpage is where you can change your name, time zone, email address, and password. Your name is important if you're involved in a group in the app. The time zone is important for the timing of reminders and notifications that you may opt for us to send to you. The subscription subpage tracks your subscription status and bonus days awards and gives you an accounting of all of these related events. You can click here to subscribe. We're still building out our notification system, but for now you can enable a once daily notification email where we'll tell you the number of recalls due for that day, which are scheduled into the practice tab. Here's a sample of one of those emails. If you click practice for the recalls due today, a practice session will open a new browser tab. All of your library items that are due in the next 48 hours or overdue will be listed to remind you to finish processing of these files based upon the deadlines that you set. If you click one of these items in the email, it will open in a new browser tab. You can also enable browser notifications for reminders to help keep you on top of your work. You can turn on which days of the week you wish to receive reminders and which time of day on weekdays and on weekend days. If you relocate to a different time zone, you may want to reset your time zone in the account subpage. The Your Progress subpage is where you can see a bunch of stats about your performance, and I do recall there are various charts as well as a collection of factoids about how you're doing. This section is still a work in progress for us. The Settings subpage is still pretty sparse at this time. You can globally control the auto-playing of recorded audios in the Q&A section of, of your recalls during practice, and you can customize the algorithm that we use to spread out your practice workload for days when you have a lot of recalls that are due.
If you want to export a CSV of all of your recalls, just click here and we'll download it to your computer. I do recall works in modern browsers on all contemporary mobile devices. Everything that you can do in I do recall on your computer's web browser, you can also do in the web browser on your phone or other mobile device. We don't yet offer native apps for download to mobile devices from app stores. Depending upon your screen size, the left sidebar may appear in the footer as it is seen here in this emulated screen of an iPhone. Whenever you need access to some functionality that you're used to having when using I do recall on a computer, Check behind the three dots menu and you'll find it is only one tap away. We do offer native desktop versions of I do recall. These function even when you are offline. A copy of your recalls and learning files will be stored locally on your computer. Syncing is done with the cloud so that if you do some work locally and you have a web connection, your account will be updated online and subsequently, if you open up I do recall in a browser on your phone, it will display the latest version of your data. The desktop version works nearly identically to the web version. You'll be asked to sync it with your account in the cloud when you begin to use it for the first time. It may take a few minutes to download all of your content for local storage. There may be other times when you'll be asked or will need to manually trigger a sync by clicking here. I do recall as a web application that helps students and lifelong learners be more successful and remember what they learn. It's a technology and a system based on proven cognitive science and education science principles of how we learn. While we've spent a long time in this video explaining its many features, you can get started easily doing its core unique activity, and that's uploading any piece of your learning materials to the library to read, watch, or listen there. When you come across any fact, concept, or nugget of knowledge that you want to remember, pause for a few seconds and make a spaced repetition flashcard that we call a recall. It will be linked to the exact location in your content where you learned it. Every day, the I Do Recall Space Repetition algorithm will show you the learnings that you're close to forgetting. If you struggle with the answer, just click the source link and you will be taken to the exact location in your study materials where you first learned the concept. Quickly refresh your memory and then get back to your practice session. Use I Do Recall to maintain your knowledge for the rest of your academic career and rest of your life. I Do Recall works in the browser of computers, phones, and other mobile devices. We also offer native desktop applications. We wish for you to be the best that you can be in school and in life.